Okay, hi everyone. We are good to see you all. We are uh, about to get going here. Um, today, we are going to uh, continue where we left off. Um, however, we're going to go a little while back to Rabbi Arush's book, The Garden of Amunah. And then we'll come back to Rabbi Kivak and uh, see if we can... Uh, wrap up this section of the book over here. Um, if you remember, welcome guys, if you remember, we were speaking about these two experiences that the Chacham had that highlighted part of the, of the real challenge and negative experience of being someone like the Chacham someone who has this really toxic way of thinking. Uh, interestingly enough, I've been thinking about the word toxic and how we use it often here as uh, to say either toxic thoughts or toxic consciousness, sometimes toxic wisdom. And I was discussing it with somebody and sometimes the word toxic is just a toxic word. You know, it gets used often too much nowadays. Maybe some people, you can label someone that person's toxic, toxic this, toxic that. It doesn't feel good. So I'm looking for another word, guys, to, uh, to put in front of wisdom or thoughts to, to explain the, the real negative, the, 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 the unhealthy way that the Chacham thinks that pulls us down and pulls us into bad places. Anyway, that's a side point. Maybe you'll help me out, guys. We'll see. So anyway, so we had these experiences. The first one was he made this gold ring, remember? And for a noble person, and the noble person didn't like it, and it totally broke him. He, he could not take it. Then he made a, uh, a carved a fancy gemstone for another noble person, and the noble person loved it, but he saw that there was one little mistake in it, and he couldn't take it. So we're moving on to another case today. Um, uh... But before we get there, we're going to we're going to switch over to Rabbi Arush to page two hundred nine in this book, the Garden of Imuna, the Garden of sorry, Garden of Wisdom, and uh, we're going to see some of. So we've been we've been listening to the Torah of Rav Kivak for for months now. We're going to go back to a little bit of, of Rav Arush Torah here and see how they see how they come together. So check out page two hundred nine. We're speaking now about when he made the gemstone. And he carved it. He did a copy. He carved a, a copy of a beautiful gemstone into another gemstone. There was like a, a sculpture made into it, right? And the guy loved it. He was very happy with the work that the Chacham did. But the Chacham was like, there was one little thing that nobody else noticed. And, and he couldn't take it. He couldn't take it. So Rav Arush titles this aspect, the aspect of self-persecution. And how self-persecution is something that can be very dangerous, dangerous to us. It can be one of these forces that pulls us down, one of these things that can be very toxic for us, like the word toxic sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it comes like this. What happens? We find ourselves in a situation where we do something, and we do something, and it's not... We mess it up a little bit, and we don't let ourselves rest. We don't give ourselves peace of mind because we made this one little mistake, right? As I mentioned to you, I feel like this is me when I'm cooking food, right? If somebody else makes food and there's something a little wrong with it, I'm very happy with it. I'm very thankful that someone else made the food. But if I like mess it up a little bit, I remember Yaakov, we were talking about this, right? I'm so upset. I can't stand it, right? So I got to work on this. It's a problem, <laughs> right? But, but on a, let's t take it out of the realm of just food. Let's say it's something, you know, much more important than just dinner one night, right? Something, something serious that you did and you just, you made a little bit of a mistake. It's okay. Nobody's really upset. But you, you made a mistake somewhere important in your life, something that you did, and you can't forgive yourself. You can't let it go. <coughs> so what are we saying if we behave like that? So Ravarish is pointing out an important idea, right? What we're supposed to be is that we're supposed to understand and we're supposed to live with Amuna. That means that every moment 
I'm understanding that Hashem is talking to me. And everything I experience and everything that I do, and especially these types of things that affect me on a powerful spiritual and emotional level, I have to remember always that Hashem is talking to me and Hashem is interacting with me, right? So if I do something that's not perfect, I have to, and, and, and I don't acknowledge that, I'm going to be very, very, very disappointed. I'm going to be very unhappy. It's going to break me, right? So as Rav Arush says, a little bit way down the second paragraph, page 209, rather than interpret his tiny setback as a gentle message from a loving Father in Heaven to re-inspect his priorities in life and adjust his behavior accordingly, he blindly attributed the mistake to himself. Right? So things didn't go exactly the way that we wanted. And, and, but it's okay, but it's not exactly the way we wanted. Right? So if we just are very upset with ourselves and we can't let it go, right? It means that we're, we're like he likes to say in this book a lot, we're behaving in a heretical way. It's like as if we're saying Hashem's not around. There's no such thing as Hashem. Rather, we should be like, oh, this is a message from Hashem. I need to listen to the message. Maybe I have to, as he says, reinspect my priorities. Stop for a, a few minutes. Go talk to Hashem. Hashem, what, am I, what, what do I need to work on? Where do I need to, to, to put more effort into? Where do I need to, to, you know, to, give, to, to, to do the opposite? Where do I need to surrender more to you, Hashem? Right? And then I can hear that message and move forward. If I don't hear that message, I'm only, and I think it's all me, right? It's arrogance. Then I'm upset. Then I can't take it. And then I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't let it go. I can't let it go. Right? Surrender and let go. So he says, further, according to the princes of Amuna, a lack of success is still success. Accor you hear that? According to the principles of Amuna, a lack of success is still success. Why? In that it is a catalyst to stimulate prayer, teshuva, spiritual growth, and enhanced closeness to Hashem. So once again, things are not going my way. Something happens and it's not the way I want it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to be upset. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be angry at myself for who knows how long. That's it? No! What should it do? It should, it, should, it should just guide me into these places. Tefillah, teshuva, spiritual growth, enhanced closeness to Hashem. It should just send me out. Like the Breslin results always like to say, if you have something that you can't figure out, take it to the forest. Right? Take it to the forest. Go talk to Hashem. Right? Hashem wants to hear you. So He's giving you something that bothers you. <laughs> so you go talk to Him about it. So this is, this is we're, we're just off the mark, Rav Arash is telling us. So he gives us two points over here. The two main points of Amuna. if you read the book, The Garden of Amuna. It was my first book. Yeah, so this is two of the main points of Amuna. The first is that everything is from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. And the second point is that everything is in some way meant for my good. Right? He says it's for our ultimate welfare. And if as long as I know that, everywhere I look, I'll, I'll take the message and I'll use it in one of these ways. To look at my own actions and to come to a place of, of tefillah, of talking to Hashem and spiritual, personal and spiritual growth. So he then goes on to say that there's two types of people that are going to suffer from this problem of not being able, of, of self-persecution and not being able to let go. Self persecution, not being able to. So, what are these two types of people? I don't really like the words they use here in English, but we'll say them anyway. He, said, he says the first one is, <laughs> I really don't like these words, but it's the stubborn heretics. It's very uh, accusatory, you know? Like, so, stubborn heretics mean someone who's, who's fighting Hashem in their minds, right? Despite the, despite the fact that Hashem is in their lives, they're miserable, right? Meaning what? They just, they, they're, they, they actively don't want to let go. They are doing everything they can to stay, to, to, to ignore Hashem, to be far away from Hashem. And so, like he's going to say later, this is the Chacham of our story over here. He's this type of person. He just is always trying to do things to get away from himself, really. To get away from his deeper connection 
Yeah, so he's looking to this place, he's looking to that place, he's looking to this job, that job, this profession. He's always, right? He's always looking never right where he is. Right? He's, he's like, it's as if he's fighting against Hashem all the time. Actively. Actively fighting against Hashem. So that's the, the stubborn version. Second type, this is really very bad wording, but he says is the, the, the depressed heretics. Right? So he says over here, this is the person who's, who's like, who, who's docile and has no sense of self-worth. So this person sees himself as an unsuccessful loser. Right? They're just, they're, they're low. They're, they're unhappy. So he says that, that if they would realize that everything, that everything comes from Hashem, this is on page 210, by the way, and subsequently place, replace their melancholy and complaining with prayer, their lives would turn completely around for the better. So I would say maybe slightly differently. You have a person who, who is very down, right? Their, their things aren't going well for them, and right? So what are they doing? They're blaming themselves, and it makes them feel very low. So they become withdrawn and, and, and quiet. Um, and maybe they blame. They, these type of people like to blame other people also, right? It's this person's fault, this person's fault. But they don't go actively trying to do all these amazing things like the Chacham of our story, which is also not good, right? They just withdraw and they get sad and angry, right? It's a difficult place to be. It really is. So what should they be doing, once again, that, that, that should be in, in, in the same way? They should, if, if, if such a person would be conscious of the fact, once again, those two principles, that everything that I experience is from Hashem. It's Hashem talking to me. And it's all meant for my good. So instead of feeling like I'm a failure and I'm the worst or blaming everyone else for everything that's going on, they would use it as an opportunity to what? Either sort things out that need to be sorted out or use it as an opportunity to be drawn to Hashem, to go and talk to Hashem, Davin, right? To go, what were the three, the three things he said over here? He said like a few things. Uh, tefillah, teshuva, spiritual growth, and closeness to Hashem, right? If we feel wet weather, it's we're feeling frustrated and angry and we're running out and doing all these things, go out to the forest, go out to the field, go to that room in our house where we can be quiet and no one's there and talk to Hashem. If we're sad and withdrawn and upset at ourselves and upset at the world, right? So don't, don't close ourselves in. Take it to the forest. Take it to that place where you talk to Hashem. And let's go speak to Hashem. By the way, I'm going to add this in here. He doesn't say this over here. But um, it really, really, really helps also. It's very important that we have um, close friends, confidants, that we, can, that we can really trust. That we can talk to when we, when we, need, to talk, when we need to talk about something. And we know that we can trust them. We know that we can pour our hearts out to them and they're not going to betray us. They're not going to hurt us, right? So we need to go to Hashem. It's important to, in tefillah and we need to work on ourselves. But at the same time, to have a, a chaver toiv, a, a really good, solid, beloved friend is, is tremendously important. So something to think about. Something to think about. So basically, he says it in a few words down here on page 210. When life doesn't go according to plan, there is one of two alternatives. Either we can get closer to Hashem or farther away from Hashem. Right? Either we get more upset and angry at ourselves, at other people, or we go and get our communication with Hashem in order. We get closer to Hashem. Those, those are the two options. And lest we think that with some of the words that we were saying over here that I don't like, like calling people heretics and, and stubborn and depressed when we're just really having a hard time, right? <laughs> he says in very sweet words over here, within every setback is an intrinsic message from Hashem. I miss you, beloved son or daughter. It's time for you to call me, right? It's time for you to call me. I miss you. It's like, it's like Hashem is sending a message. He's like our, you know, got to call your mother, got to call your father, speak to them, they miss you. Hashem sending us a message, call me. Speak to me. Talk to me. Right? Yeah. It's not, it's not easy stuff. Okay. So, in the realm of perfection. So, 
Um, he's going to say something here that we've said many times, and it's nice to see someone else saying it because uh, a little bit of validation for us in, in our group over here. But um, he says, that, that, so we have two aspects of arrogance over here on, of these two people, these two groups of people. The stubborn person who's all fighting, who's fighting Hashem, right? So he thinks, stubborn people who think they don't need Hashem live in a bubble of fantasy that they are perfect, Right? I can do it. I'm great. I'm fantastic. So therefore, when life shows them otherwise, they're bitterly depressed. When life shows them, oh, you're not what you think you are, and you make mistakes, and people get upset with you, and right, you know, it, it pushes those specific buttons that you need pushed, right? That happens to such a person who, who is arrogant, who thinks that, that they're the best, and that everything's on my shoulders, I can do everything. Ooh, it hurts. It hurts, and it's going to be a hard time. Such people either persecute themselves or violently blame others for their troubles. Right? Everybody with me on that one? You ever get like that? Yeah. Oh, right? So we can sometimes... We can... Uh, this is what happens. This is, this is me with the cook, overcooking the steak. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I probably have more serious examples of it for myself as well. <laughs> but, you know, what are you so upset for? Okay? Take the Musr. You know what the Musr is to me over there? You know what the message from Hashem is? Musr, musr and Messer. Maybe the same thing. A, a message. Don't think so much about food. <laughs> Don't be so nitpicky about, about your food. You have sustenance. You have, you have a piece of meat. You know what it took to put that meat here? Be happy. Be thankful. Don't be so, that's not where you need to put your care and your thoughts and your aspirations in whether this piece of animal meat was cooked properly, right? It's maybe, not animal meat. It's maybe, a steak. Maybe that's, one, a maybe that's one message. Maybe that's one message. <laughs> right, guys? Maybe that's one message. But don't persecute yourself. Take the message. So, one thing that we always say that he's saying over here is that arrogance manifests itself in two ways. Sometimes arrogance is the guy who walks around bragging. And what's the word he uses over here? Bragging and conceit. Right? The guy who walks around and who's like, yeah, I'm all that. And, uh, you know, who dresses in a certain way. You can see from the clothes that they're like... Pointy shoes. They're as pointy shoes, fancy pants. <laughs> right? From, the, from this, you can see already that this person is arrogant. And they snub their nose at people, they look down at people, they talk down at people, such as a, is, a, is what most people think to be arrogance, right? Why? Because that person does not live with the idea that Hashem is with him, and that everything is happening for a reason, and that Hashem is guiding us, and Hashem only wants what's best for us. Therefore, they feel that everything is up to them. And in order to try and have some type of comfort with that living in that world, they have to make themselves as big as possible and as proficient and perfect as possible to be able to make things go the way they're supposed to go. Such is the, the general thought about what an arrogant person is. So he says very clearly, like we always say, that that's only one aspect of it. Because the same root thought process that there's no Hashem, there's no rhyme or reason to things, right? And, and everything is, is, is on my shoulders. Either I'm going to make it perfect, I'm going to make it good, or it's not going to be good, right? The other side of that is, is that it can just cause a person to be overwhelmed, to withdraw, and to not do anything. To be sad and, and, and blameful, to be a victim, and not to do anything, right? So these two things are coming from the same place. And, uh, and we have to be careful for this. We have to be careful. Rather, who do we want to be? We want to be the person who knows that Hashem is at the helm and is leading us and is guiding us and everything that happens is there for us. All we have to do is hear the message and move in the right direction. That's it. That's it. Is it that simple? Yes, it is. <laughs> Simple? Absolutely. It's that simple. Is it easy? Definitely not always. Right? So, What's the difference between simple and easy? Simple is like 
that, that, that is what it is. Is it easy to get ourselves to follow that? No. Right? Definitely not. Oy vah oy. Not easy. So he brings over here a famous story from the, uh, from, uh, that the Gemara brings. I'm sure everybody has heard of this person before. Um, if you uh, look on page 213 over here, he says it's the story of Nachum Ish Gamzu. Why was he called Nachum Ish Gamzu, the man of Gamzu? Because he would always say, whenever something bad happened, he would say, Gamzu Latoiva. This is also for the good, is what it means. Nachum Ish Gamzu. Last week we had a, we had a, my wife, Gamzu Latoiva story, remember? Yeah, the chicken soup. Chicken soup on the oh, deck oh, with, with the raccoons, gosh. yeah. I yeah. I oh my gosh, I would have been angry, yeah. That's a case where it's simple that you have to say, Gamzu Latoiva, okay, good. But for me, it would not be easy. I would be angry. I'd be looking for the, uh, the firearm to go and get that, that raccoon. Anyway, just kidding. <laughs> so Nachumish Gamzu was this person who, who was a holy person who lived with Hashem all the time, consciously. And so he was always able to say, Nachum, he was always able to say, this is also for the good when something bad happens. So the story goes like this. If you want to see it, it's on page 213. I'm just going to paraphrase it. But, um, so, uh, the, the Caesar was upset with the Jews. And so, the Jewish people, they gathered together all of the money they could find. They were already not in a good position and pretty downtrodden. They gathered together all the money they could find and they bought a whole bunch of precious gemstones that the Caesar liked. And they filled a chest with these gemstones. And Nachum Ishgamzu was chosen to be the messenger to deliver this chest of gems to the Caesar in Rome. Caesar in Rome, right? So he went and on the way he stopped in, a, in an inn, in a hotel. And while he was there, he fell asleep and some thieves robbed him. They took all of the precious gems. That was like the entire wealth of the Jewish people at the time. <laughs> and they refilled the chest with dirt. And so, uh, but he woke up and he, he went his way. He, he actually felt that something's not right with, with the chest. Something's not right. It's not where it's supposed to be. He sees what it is. But he says, what? Gamzu Latova. Okay, this is, this is the way Hashem wants it to be. I'm just going to keep being a person of Emuna and trying to do my job. So he continues on to Rome. And he goes and he's announced who he is, that he's come to see the, the Caesar, you know, and the Caesar comes and he opens the chest and they see, the advisors and the Caesar see that it's just a chest full of dirt. And they're like, is this a joke? What, uh, what's going on here? And Nachumish Gamzu, how do you think he looked at that moment? Cool as a cucumber. He's just standing there. He's like, I'm here. I'm here as the servant of Hashem. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. He's not afraid. Right? Powerful, strong, emuna, even in such a situation. Nothing's shaking him. Right? Why? Because Gamzu Latifa. This is also really good. So what happens? Because of his tremendous uh, emuna and his tremendous Gamzu latoiva so he merited that Eliyahu Anavi, Elijah the prophet, came and appeared and as one of the advisors and said to the Caesar, Oh, this must be the special, famous, magical dirt of the Jewish people. What's the story? There's a, the Medrash says that by Avram Avinu, when he was fighting the wars, he also merited this miraculous relationship with, with the dirt, where he could pick up a handful of dirt and throw it, and the dirt would all turn into arrows and would, would destroy his enemies. So, so they said... So Elijah, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Novi said, this must be what the Jewish people are giving to us. We're having problems at our northern border over here with these people that we're fighting. Let's take it over there and test it out. So sure enough, they take the, the chest over there to the battlefield and they pick it up and they throw it and it turns into arrows and it destroys their enemy, it vanquishes their enemy. And so they come back and what do they do? They thank them very much. They say, don't worry. 
Jewish people are back on our good side. We'll take care of you. And we're going to refill now your chest with precious pearls and jewels and all kinds of good things. You can go back on your way. And so he goes back on his way. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> he probably saw the jewels and gems and they were expecting to be like, wow, amazing, thank you. But he was just like, come to the Right? <laughs> that's, not, that's not really the story. That's my made up part. So anyway, so he goes back and on the way back, he stops in the same inn. And the same robbers are there and they see that he made it back. And and then that he has a chest full of precious gems, and so and so they're like, "What happened?" And he's like, "Nothing. I just I took the chest full of dirt. Someone you know exchanged it, took it to them, and they really liked it. They loved the dirt. So they not only did they let me go, but they sent me back with a chest full of jewels. That's what the robbers do. They load up a bunch of carriages with dirt." from the same area where they got that dirt from. They head over to Rome and they stroll right into the palace of the Caesar and they say, here, look what we've brought for you. Carts full of dirt. And they were all executed on the spot. Oh my gosh. Right? I think they tested it. Yeah, they took up a thing, tried to throw it, just fell to the ground <laughs> like, like normal earth, right? So uh, Rabbi Arsh says in the book over here, you see what is always the final end of the thief and the person of untruth, right? It all comes crashing down at some point. And so is the story of, of the, of, uh, so Nachum Ishgam Zulachara was a Tam, a person of Tamimus, a person of powerful Emuna, and this is, how, this is how he lived. And we can all, we can all, uh, we can all put that into our own lives. Right? If we're able to say Gamzu Latoiva and see why things happen, very often, very often we see a few months down the road, a year down the road, somehow we're like, oh my gosh, I see. That was, I'm really glad that happened. Because now, whatever. <laughs> whatever the story is. We have lots of these stories, right? Lots of these stories. Beautiful. So, um,. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted, I wanted to just, before we move forward, I just wanted to, uh, to, to read the last paragraph of, of, of Kivak before we move to the next section of the doctor, which I think we started last time. Did we talk about the doctor last time? I don't think so. Maybe not. Okay. So just the last paragraph here. It says like this, along these lines of what we're talking about over here, of uh, <coughs> expecting ourselves to be perfect and persecuting ourselves and, and everything. Listen to these beautiful words. Rabbeinu HaKadosh Vosapar Lanu, Kol Zeis. Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Rabbi Nachman is telling us all of this, Kadesh HaNisar L'Kabo Me'atam Es HaEmes, that we should be uh, awakened to receive from the Tam the truth. Ladas Sha'anirak Adam. To know that I'm just a person. That's it. Anirak Adam. Ve'aniyachol Litois. And I'm, uh, it's possible that I'm going to make mistakes. <laughs> I'm going to make mistakes. It's Hashem who makes the chain in the world. Remember, remember how he said about his ring? Oh, if this was in Spain, it would be like top, top price. But over here, it doesn't have chain. Well, you know why? It's not up to you. It's, you, you. You make where you are. You do your best. And if you're a person of Amuna, Hashem's going to put chain onto the things you do, right? But it doesn't matter what someone thinks on the other side of the world. It, like, it literally has no bearing on you whatsoever. <laughs> Hashem makes the chain in the world. So be a person of emuna and tamimus. Mimela, im amrli mashahu, if someone says something to me, imishu paga b'chavoydi, if someone embarrasses me, right, Give, uh, takes a chip out of my honor, im kan, this is like, this is very, very sweet, what we're about to see over here. This is so important. Imkan anilom wetzechen. If I'm not valued right where I am right now, mikol makayim anikain wetzechen b'makayim acher. It doesn't matter. I will be valued somewhere else. Meaning, I don't have to try to pretend to be like this person over here. I have my own intrinsic value, and Hashem put me here for a reason. And I'm needed somewhere. 
my value is going to come out somewhere. And I don't have to try to pretend to be this person. I don't have to try to pretend to be that person. I don't have to say that, oh, you guys are all wrong. If we were in Spain or wherever, then you guys would love me. <laughs> right? We don't have to say that. We say that everybody has to know. We all have something totally unique, amazing, and special. We have important things to do in the world, every single person. And it doesn't have to be the same as anyone else. I just got to keep bitmimus, always talking to Hashem, working on Torah and mitzvahs, doing good things every day, just trying to be a good person, trying to actualize my own goodness. That's probably a good line to put in our definitions of tmimus. Always trying to actualize my own goodness. That's a good one. Right? And, and uh, Hashem put me here for a reason. If I try to use what Hashem gave me in a good way, it's going to be good somewhere. It's going to have the effect that it's supposed to have somewhere. Right? Like, like, yeah. like, like we said last week about that guy who had the great idea, remember? About, and then, but he's not going to be happy unless he makes it into a whole organization. Right? What did we say? Maybe your job is just to use that to teach your children. Maybe that's where you're going to be amazing. That's why you were given that idea. Or a few other people in your, in your sphere. It doesn't have to change the whole entire world necessarily, right? It doesn't have to be heard in Spain. <laughs> right? This is what he says. Ki Hashem is barach, mashkiach Why? Because Hashem is guiding everything. And Hashem put you in this place right now to do something. Every person. The people that, I always like to think of it, all the people that we know, right, we're supposed to do something together. Whatever it is. It could be something simple, it could be something huge, who knows, right? The families that we're in, we're there for a reason. We have, to, we have th- issues. We have things that, we, that we're, we're meant to be there, right? And the talents that we have, we're given them for a reason. The, the, the we like to say challenges in a, in a nice way, but the places where we're not so talented, <laughs> we also have that for a reason, right? We have that for a reason. You know, you can have like a, in, in, in like one family, you can have some people where like, let's say the parents are very good at singing and they have a beautiful voice. And then like one, or, one of the kids or two of the kids also, they just, they have it naturally. And then you can have another kid that's totally tone deaf. <laughs> right? Who knows? Why is that person there? They have, a, they have a different thing to do. They have something to do and it's unique and it's going to come out. Because Hashem runs everything. And through this, we can understand the root of the existence of, the, of honor and, and val- ascribed value in the world. So, meaning, honor that we, we experience is not what we think it is. Real honor is not what we think it is. What should it be? A person has to know, I don't do anything on my own. I don't do anything myself. Everything's from Hashem. Anything that comes down to a person that causes them to be valued or have charm or have grace or presence. Hakol hevel v'shav v'chaval al yamav v'sha'osav asher ha-machshava oiska v'hevel hazeh. If anyone is trying to build honor for themselves, I'm so good at this, I'm so great at this, you should all follow me, you should all love me, you should, right? Ugh, it's not going to be good. <laughs> it's not going to end well, as we like to say. Right? We have to be careful. So, in the next section now, we're going to move on to the aspect of, of, the, of the doctor. Um, we're, going to see, we're going to see how this plays out in a, in a pretty awesome way. Because the whole Indian of the doctor is, is, is like a third aspect of this. So let's, let's go over to, to... We're going to bounce back and forth from Rav Kivak and Rav Arash over here, okay? So let's, let's hear the story first of all. Uh, let's see... Also, from his work as a doctor, he suffered. When he came to a sick person and gave them a treatment, he knew with certainty that if the man would only survive, he would be healed entirely. Why? Because the treatment was an amazing one. 
Then afterwards, if the man died, everyone would say he was at fault and he suffered greatly from this. Right? This one's interesting because, like Bemis, it's really bad. If, uh, you know, if a doctor is having patients dying and people are saying that it's your fault, that's, that's very, that's, that's like, really, that's a high level tsar. <laughs> right? This is not just he, he wasn't happy exactly with the way he, uh, one of the little parts of his carving. This is like, you killed somebody. And people are calling him a killer. This is a big one, right? But, okay, besides for that, that just uh, stands out for me. So let's read, let's read, let's read with Kivak a little bit here, and we'll, uh, we'll start to unpack it. With this one, his suffering reaches a third level. Because with the first two, when he made the ring and he carved the gemstone, he was embarrassed, right? The first one he was embarrassed because the guy told him it wasn't good. Second one he was embarrassed because of his own self, self-criticism and self-perfection, need for self-perfection. But they didn't call him a murderer then. They didn't call him a killer. Right? So yeah, the second one. He, it was good, but he, 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 had, he had suffering from it. With the third level of, of suffering that he has, he becomes tremendously embarrassed. Because now the whole world is saying that this patient died because of him. On his watch, really, through his hands. So it's a third level. So he says like this. Um, let's go to Rav Arush for a second. We're going to go back and forth over here. I'm probably not going to completely read everything. But Rav Arush says like this. He says that, um, and you should know everybody, that in, in Rabbi Nachman and in Breslov in general, they really like to pick on doctors. <laughs> they, they don't like doctors. Remember, my wife is a doctor, so it uh, <laughs> presents, presents some problems. I also know many, many really hardcore Breslovers who are doctors, so there's something in there that's... There's a, there's a truth that not everyone understands. But. So why? Because you see a lot of times by doctors... They, they do have a tendency to become arrogant. My wife does not fall into this category. Definitely, she's really uh, very holy as a doctor. She's like, she, she, before she does anything, as when she's working, she, like, she says, she, she talks to Hashem when she's doing it. She's like saying, please Hashem, make this go well, that it shouldn't hurt them, that it shouldn't do this. She like sits in spare time and says to heal him and stuff like this. She, she's very special. Um, but you know, there's such a thing that doctors can be arrogant. And, uh, and maybe, please, if there are any surgeons out here, don't be mad at me, but maybe especially surgeons could be. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sort of not kidding, but anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, but you can't blame them, right? They literally have people's lives in their hands. They literally are saving people's lives. Like, they can come in, dying, they leave, they're, they're saved. People are crying and thanking them. You saved my life. You saved my life. Okay, it's very hard to not develop some level of arrogance with that. You, I would think. I wouldn't know, but I, wouldn't th- I would think. So it's not easy. So, but the main thing is that, that, that the Rav says over here, the Kiva is going to say, is that a doctor can be a holy person as long as they know that they're just a, 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 a channel through which... Hashem chooses to heal people, right? And, and as we know, there's a, there's a famous idea that, uh, I mean, this is just something that we know, that sometimes like, the same thing doesn't work for two people. Sometimes there's, there's plenty of miraculous things that happen in, in stories of medical issues, where w- one day it's one way and the next day it's another way, where the same thing works for one person, it doesn't work for another person, it works one time on, this, on one person, and a second time, even on the same person, it doesn't do the same thing, right? We all have to know that, 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 that any healing that happens in the world comes from Hashem. And we've got to go to a doctor to help us. And, but we have to have a muna, that the ultimate refuah comes from Hashem, and 
maybe more important, we have to find doctors who know that the ultimate refuah comes from Hashem. Right? So there's a famous story that he brings down here on page 217 in the Garden of Wisdom. I'll paraphrase it once again. But where, uh, where Rabbi Nachman uh, and Rabbi Nassim and the third one that we've heard of before, Rabbi Naftali, were all, were all together. And they were, uh, they were driving outside of a town and they came to, to an inn, another inn story, right? And at this inn, the, the innkeeper brought them out some cheese to eat, okay? So, as I'm sure we all remember, Rabbi Nachman suffered from tuberculosis, and so did Rabbi Naftali. He also suffered from tuberculosis. And so, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Naftali didn't want to eat the cheese. Rabbi Nachman didn't eat the cheese. Rabbi Naftali didn't want to eat the cheese. And Rabbi Nachman said to him, you know, eat the cheese. What, 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 what's, what's the big deal? And, and he said, it, it, it won't hurt you. So, so, so Rabbi Naftali said to Rabbi Nassim, you're, you're telling me don't eat the cheese? The Rebbe is right here. Let him tell me not to eat. Let, let, him, let, let him tell me to eat the cheese. And so Rabbi Nachman told him, yeah, go ahead, eat the cheese. You could eat the cheese. So he ate the cheese, and as they were driving back, on the, after they left the inn, he noticed, they noticed that his, that his cough seemed to be less and and Rabbi Nachman took it uh, took the opportunity to say that you see it's it's not it's not the cheese that makes you sick it's Hashem Hashem can Hashem can heal you with a piece of cheese or Hashem can make you sick with a piece of cheese he can make your cough worth, worse with a piece of cheese he can make your cough better with a piece of cheese so uh, apparently by the way to understand the story properly dairy uh, is not good for people with serious coughs and lung issues and tuberculosis. I've heard this before. Phlegm. Yeah, phlegm. 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 <laughs> um, so, uh, right. So, don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> right. Uh, we're talking about Rabbi Nachman and Rabbi Nassim and Rabbi Tali, the three, like, very holy tzaddikim. So, these these what? They all had tuberculosis. Uh, just the two of them. Rabbi Nassim did not. Yeah. So um, Rabbi Nachman died of tuberculosis when he was when he was um, thirty eight years old. Wow. Yeah, thirty nine, thirty eight, thirty nine. I don't remember. Um, yeah. So what's going on here? What's what's the story all about? And and th- this is the point. There's a whole there's a whole Torah in the Kutimran about this. That that um, the doctor Torah in the Kutimran that I would call it, right? Where he explains that especially in those days, all medicines were like herbal were herbs. They weren't synthetic, they didn't have such capabilities, right? And one of the reasons why, why they were very against doctors back then is because it was really like a crapshoot going to doctors back then. It wasn't like now where things are proven, scientific blind studies and everything's very clear, right? I see some uh, eyebrows going up there. Right? We know antibiotics work, for example, right? We know analgesics work. Things that we know work, work, right? So, so, um, so it was very, it was very sketchy. You know, they would have some herbal remedies, the things that we probably nowadays would call like home remedies. You know, this is the kind of things they had and they prescribed. But they didn't really know what they were doing so much. So it really wasn't such a. Great, it was, it was, it could have been dangerous. But the main point was, was that everything was herbal. And Rabbi Nachman has this Torah where he explains that that you know where things are planted in the world, they're affected by, you know, like certain things grow only in certain areas in the world and not in other areas in the world. Why? Because the way he explains it is because they're in a certain place and that certain place is governed by certain stars and, and combinations of things and, and the way things are, only that can grow there. And so you see, there'll be certain kinds of vegetation in, certain, in a certain place and certain kinds of people in a certain place. And, if, and it's all because that place has a certain mazel, has a certain spiritual force that comes to it. And, that, and that's just in a big picture way. But so too, every plant has a certain spiritual force that, 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 that enlivens it, that makes it live and grow and gives it strength. And lest you think it's too crazy and Hasidic or Kabbalistic, it's one of the first Rashis in all of, in all of the Chumash, the simple Pshat, the simple meaning of the, of, of the Psukim. Rashi says that there's not a single blade of grass that doesn't have 
an angel above that guides it to grow. Right? Rashi says this, right? So, so meaning there's a spiritual force attached to every type of, of, of herbage in the world. And it's that, it's the fact that, there, that it has a spiritual enlivenment to it, a vitality to it, that gives it a particular ability to, 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 to heal. But it's not limited to that even. Hashem can make a person be healed and, and, and I think he says over there, Hashem can heal a person if they just drink water. Right? Because it's not the, this herb, it's not the echinacea, it's not the vitamin C, it's not the whatever the rest of them are. Right? It's, it's, it's the Rebona Shalom putting spiritual forces into the world that then come and give life and give energy to things. That's what heals us. So if a person, he says, would have powerful enough emuna and would be so connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and so tightly attached, like the story of Nachum Gamzu, where he was not afraid, he had no, no worry whatsoever, and miracles happened through him, we would also have the same miraculous existence. And if we were sick, we could just drink water with a, with a strong prayer, and we'd be okay. Right? And uh, dare I even say to each of us, on our own level, we have a certain aspect of this. Right? But... What, uh, if, if, if we're not to such a state of amuna where we give everything to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we're not upset by all these things and we don't feel like we identify with the Chacham <laughs> at some points, which I'm sure we all do, right? we're not on that level. So we don't experience constant miraculous existence. But it's there. The power is there. And the more that we attach our amuna to Hashem and not to not to you know, the, the doctor aspect that we're talking about over here. The, the closer we'll be to Hashem, the healthier we'll be and everything. But it has to be balanced with, with what we do. Hashem never wants us, right? It's important. It's a simple, this is Judaism 101, ABCs, right? Hashem does not want us to sit back and say, I believe Hashem will take care of me. So I'm just going to stay here and not move. No, Hashem wants us to work and wants us to, to you know, grow our garden and grow our vegetables do what we have to do, I mean, if we have that type of existence, <laughs> and study, and put in our own effort, and, and daven, tefillah, prayer should be part of our hishtadlis, part of our effort also. And together with that, the more emuna we have, the more successful that we'll be, and the less we'll have to, the more we'll see help from Hashem. The more we'll see siyata dishmaya. That's the vort. So this is, the, this is the issue over here that we're talking about. This is the thing that we have to look out for over here. Um, and the doctor is just a great example of it. So the, the, we, have to look, we have to be careful. If the doctor became a doctor because of the prestige and the status and the, and the God complex, right? Then look out. That's going to that's gonna be difficult. He's not going to have the power. So too by us, with everything we do. If I, if I only do things because I think they're going to they're gonna give me status, but I don't believe that I'm, it's just the power of Hashem working through me, I'm going to be miserable because I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail strongly. So this is, the, this is the vort of the doctor here. This is the lesson of, of, of the doctor. Um, and and the, the status and the arrogance is a high one. He brings over here of Arush a connection to, uh, to Haman HaRasha. We're coming up to Purim. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good time to think of Haman HaRasha. Machshmoy. No graggers? No. Haman. Woo! No. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and it's, it's, it's very connected over here, right? Because Haman HaRasha, he had a position of tremendous power, of tremendous respect in, in Shushan, in the Persian Empire, right? And yet... He came and people would bow in front of him. But there was one Jew only, one Jew who wouldn't bow to him. And that's it. He can't take it. He couldn't be happy with everything that he has. The one Jew won't bow to him. Then, and his words are, Everything else doesn't matter to me one bit. Doesn't mean it's meaningless. If this one Jew will not bow to me, everything else is meaningless. Right? That desire, that need for tremendous honor at the top level to never be dishonored, maybe is uh, is a better way to say it. 
overpowered everything that he had. Right? And, and this is what happened. So why is it related over here? Because that is the same aspect of, rec- of, of thinking that it's all me and not Hashem. Right? It's all in the doctors, not in, in Hashem. Right? It's all in, is it the right medicine? Is it the right this? Is it the right dog? Is it right? Not, it's not coming from Hashem. This is, the, this, is, this is the danger. And with everything that we do, if we find ourselves doing things and they don't work out exactly right and we're devastated and, and unhappy and, and bitter, right? It's because we're not thinking the right way. We're thinking it's all about me. It's all in my hands. As soon as I say it's all coming from Hashem and I don't need to be honored, it's not about me being honored. Then, then we're okay. What should he have done? He says over here many times. So, he shouldn't, two, two things happened over here. The second thing that, happen, the second thing that happens is he, do, he goes, let's read the next part. Sometimes he would give, a, he, uh, he would heal a, per, a certain person and it would work. And everyone would say about him, Mikrahu, it was just a, it, ha, it was happenstance. It wasn't because of him. It was just like a coincidence that the guy got healed at the same time that he was healing him. Right? So what's he doing over here? How is he getting upset? On the one hand, he's upset about what people are saying about him. And, the, and on the other hand, when he does something good, he's upset that he's not getting credit for it. Right? So these are two aspects of real, toxic, unhealthy thought processes that we have when we are not living with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, when we don't have emuna. Why do I care if people are saying bad things about me? Okay, let them say. I'm, I'm just doing my part over here. I'm doing what I can. And, and whatever happens, you know the thing we always say, I'm doing my part. The outcome is up to Hashem. Right? As long as I'm doing my part. Right? And if I'm not doing my part, what do I do? And then something bad happens. So it's a message from Hashem that I should, I should think about these things and I should daven more and I should speak to my friends and, and work on these things more. Right? But I should not be worried and upset about what everyone else is saying. Right? We got to do what's important. Remember, I, I think I, I said a few times, one of the things we always, we always try to do with our shul here is we always just try to do what we think is the right thing to do. And we try not to be swayed by, you know, we, uh, we, don't, we don't get paid over here. <laughs> we, just, we just try to do things because we think it's, it's, it's good and it's the right thing to do. And then if you're doing that, then whatever happens, okay. If things go well, great. If things don't go well, it must be that Hashem doesn't want this. Fine, no problem, right? That's the way to do it. And this is, the, this, he, he, he can't do it like this. So he's upset, whatever it's saying. And then, on the other hand, he does something good. Well, what should his thought be? And, and then, then he, see, he does something good, and he sees that everybody is like, oh, this guy, ah, it's just a coincidence that this guy got healed. He's a terrible doctor. It's a coincidence that, that it worked this time. Right? He's upset still. He's not, because he's not getting the kavod, the honor, that he was the one who, who healed this person. Right? So what should he be thinking? Says Rav Arush and Rav Kivik both. Baruch Hashem, that, that Hashem chose me to be the one who was able to save the person, to give the person uh, a healing. And that's enough. So I'm not being honored, I'm not getting all the kavod. Who cares? That's, not, that's what I'm doing this for? It's, it's, it shows you what, what, what he was really doing it for. He should be doing it. I get to say, I got to be the agent of Hashem to save someone's life. It doesn't matter what they think. This is what I got to do. Baruch Hashem. That should be his focus. Right? It's a beautiful idea. Beautiful idea. Yep. So let's finish off here with something from Rav Kivak. And, uh, and, and we'll finish off with this. So, um, yeah. So he says like this. Uh, first of all, he says that there's a special... Um, Gematria over here, that there's, Kabbal- there's a Kabbalistic concept of these uh, 320 dinim, severities, spiritual severities that come and they cause, they cause, they cause like, uh, like things, that, things that we perceive to be bad happen, 
right? This is when there's din in the world. There's, there's 320 forces of din. So doctor is spelled in Hebrew that way, dalet vav kuf tes vav resh, is the gematria of this shin chaf hei, which is, which is ha shach, the, the 320 forces of judgment. Why? Because the doctor, if he is doing things the right way, and, and he's doing it in a holy way with emuna, he can sweeten those judgments. That's what a refuah is. Right? When someone is sick, is, 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 is faced with, with, with an illness, it's because there's some type of din on the person. Right? Some, there's some type of din, some type of spiritual judgment on the person. And the doctor is able to help to, to make a refuah, that means he's, he's removing those, those, that din, those judgments. So doctor is the same gematria as the, the number that's associated with din, with judgments that come down onto a person. Right? And the, the con- one of the concepts of gematria is, is it can be an either-or thing. Like you, you, you find often that the same gematria is for something good and something bad, right? That opposite. Because either you do it in a way of emuna, and then it's a tikkun. It's a hamtakas adinam. It's sweetening the judgments. Or you do it in the wrong way, and it draws in judgment and din, right? So this is what the argument Or the other way, if you spell it in a, the Yiddish way, with an aleph and, a, and an ayin instead of two vavs, doctor in the Yiddish way, Right? It's the gematria shin pei hei, which is 385, which is, of course, the gematria of shechina, with the divine presence. Why? Because when a person is sick, right, the Mishnah says that when a person is sick, the shechina is resting at the head of the person who's, who's sick. Right? So once again, the doctor can either be someone who is, who is in a very negative place, or he can be the person who brings the Shekhinah to the person, who brings the Divine Presence, who brings a Rafua, who takes away the judgments and gives a full, a full recovery to this person. That's what a doctor could be. So, yeah, but he's not like this. He is not working in this way, the Chacham. <laughs> so, he says now, we'll, we'll finish off with this. We're going we're gonna to re- remember our three points over here. V'zeh shayich l'chol echad. Fkivak says, this is applicable to every single person. When a person wants to heal themselves from a negative trait, a negative aspect of ourselves, a negative trait that we have, meaning I want to be my own doctor. I want to fix myself. I want to heal myself. Right? So what do I do? I have to remember these three things that we're dealing with over here. Right? What are the three things I have to remember? Aleph. The problem that he had was ata choyshev sha'ata oyse levad bechinas tabazav, the gold ring, right? He was upset that he made this ring and nobody liked it. Why? Because I can do it. I make it. I know what's best. I know what's perfect, right? No, that's not how it works. Hashem brings chen into the world. Hashem makes things beloved and desirable and valuable. You just do your part, and 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 if everyone else tells you it's bad. It means there's something wrong. <laughs> you just got to have a muna and do what Hashem wants. Don't think that I make the things good in the world. I make chen in the world. I make charm and grace and beauty in the world. I don't do it. The second one, Bez, was in when he made the carving. What was he doing? Why? Because he's only trying to copy the, the, the chen in the world. He's trying to make a copy of something. He's not trying to find his own inner, inner grace, his own inner, inner beauty, right? And find and find what he can do in the world. He's just trying to do like everyone else. He's looking to this person, looking to that person, and trying to emulate them in a false way. It has to be from an inner place of truth. So I can't fix myself if I think I do everything. I'm the one who makes the beauty in the world. I can't fix myself if I'm always trying to only imitate what appears to be valuable in the world. And the third one is, It's only Hashem who gives chius, vitality, life, and strength, and power to sweeten the judgments. Right? And I shouldn't be confused and upset if things are not going well in the realm of, of Rufus. You know why? 
Because that's, that's what Hashem is guiding. That's, that's the way Hashem, make, Hashem is making it. It's not me. Mashein kein, derech hachacham. I, I would say that, that that one is, is to know that, that I can't fix everything. I just have to do my part. And if people don't like it, I, I, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. They don't like it. That's not, that's not for me to worry about. And if I do things and people don't acknowledge me, right? Uh, why am I doing them? Am I doing them for acknowledgement? Or am I doing them because I wanted to accomplish something good? That's the point over there. He's so upset that they're calling him that they're calling him a, a murderer. So everyone has to know that life is in the hand of Hashem. So I I, uh, I wanted to bring this up here just because I found it hard to relate to this, as I said. Because if someone's calling you a murderer, that's a pretty serious accusation. And if you're in such a position, it's kind of hard to relate to, right? So I think maybe one way that I can personally relate to it, maybe maybe you guys can also, is that um, one way that's still pretty serious, but something we can learn from that, which is less serious and maybe more practical. So I don't know if anybody has, has uh, dealt with someone with very, very severe mental illness. I don't mean a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of depression. I mean like, like you know, one of the real difficult schizophrenia, severe you know, bipolar, or these, these types of things. It can be so, so impossible to, to deal with. Um, you know, like a, a person with, with real serious schizophrenia, they live in a world where, where things are not, things that aren't real to them are just as real as everything is to us. And if you would try to tell them that 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 what do you you're, you're seeing things you're hearing things it's not real it's just like if someone went up to you today and said that to you it's it's absolutely real to them and and you, so there it's hard to get them to take medication because would you take medication if i came up to you today and said hey nancy you're crazy <laughs> everything you think is not real right well, well, well you you wouldn't you wouldn't listen to me you'd be like who is this crazy person you think i'm the crazy one right that's that's taka what they go through. That's right. That's what they go through, and it's but it's much messier than that. That's just a, a, a nice explanation of it, right? So, so and with severe mental illness, you know, somebody who's like really, really powerfully affected by it, you know. So sometimes, maybe with people with with tremendous, real, serious issues of addiction, right? Sometimes when when dealing with such terrible, terrible, hard situations. You know, Loyalena, we should not have to experience in them. You might hear someone say, Well, if you don't do this for me, I'm gonna kill myself. Right? Or if if if, uh, if you don't help me and I kill myself, it's gonna be your fault. People say these things, this really happens. Right? And it's so important that people people in such situations know this. That if that happens, it's not it's not because of you. It's because of the illness it's because of the addiction it's because of whatever were were the circumstances going on it's not your fault you have to try your best and do it right in a certain way that's the same thing we're saying over here with with that same situation which is also hard to relate to and hopefully we don't have to deal with it very often or ever right but that requires tremendous emuna tremendous emuna to have confidence in hashem to say i'm i'm really i'm 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 praying I'm talking to Hashem, I'm davening, I'm getting advice, and I'm doing everything in my power to help this person. And I know that the way to do it seems like they think it's the worst thing to do. But you're telling me, you're telling me, the professionals are telling me, everyone's telling me, this is what I have to do. And if chas shalom, it should go, it should go in, a, in a bad way, I have to, with emuna, say that, that I, I did the right thing. I'm very sad that this didn't end well, but, but it's not my fault. I can't, tear myself down I can't hate myself I can't pull myself into such a terrible place right okay let's get away from these super difficult things for the last two minutes over here <laughs> and let's say that, that that goes with easier things also right you have an argument with somebody right or you have a disagreement in business in whatever it is right and you you really do the same thing 
if you think about it and you daven and you 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 contemplate and you get advice from good people and you have and then you go through and it creates a problem. Okay, what do you say? Gamzu This is this is this is also what Hashem wants. Okay, I'm I'm doing my best. What does a person with a muna have? Calm confidence. I'm doing my best. I'm I'm doing what I think is the right thing. I've really thought about it. I'm not fooling myself. I'm not lying to myself. I'm not making up a story about the situation. With total truth and total, total MS, I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I think is the right thing. So then I can get out. I can have some type of confidence. He says, So too, with every test, the doctor was worried about being embarrassed, right? With every test that embarrasses us, I have to know with Tamimus that Hashem made it this way. And I have nothing to be to feel to feel I shouldn't feel suffering. I shouldn't feel pain from it. This is the way that Hashem wants it to go right now. This is how it should be. Right? It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. But but you know. I find that maybe it's a little bit easier to think about it in less where the stakes aren't so high. Some of the more everyday situations to build up those muscles to deal with the, the, the more serious situations, right? But, you know, not to end on such a heavy note, we should remember that the whole, the whole, the whole back, background of everything we said today is that knowing, always working on our conscious emuna. Be consciously aware of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that He's guiding everything. He's guiding me. When something happens that embarrasses me, thank you Hashem. When something happens that works out well and, and, and I don't get praised for it, it's okay. Thank you Hashem for allowing me to be part of something that worked out well. I don't need the praise. Right? When, 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 uh, when I do something and it's not perfect, okay, this is the way Hashem wanted it. I don't have to be so down on myself. When I do something that no one else gets and I think it's great and no one likes it, okay. This is the way that Hashem wants it. What can I say? And, and this will give us the ability to, to, to get through life with a little bit of simcha, with uh, some success, being able to navigate and being, being able to do good things, to accomplish good things. And it's another, it's another set of, of um, um, the parameters of what it means to be a chacham, to have all these toxic, painful, unhealthy ways of thinking. We're working through it and, and we're adding to our list, which in Mitzvah Shem will have a real actual list at sometime soon that we can look at and, and remember all these things. Okay, thank you everybody. Any uh, questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah.